In our last session, I gave you an overall introduction about the intangible cultural heritage in China. And in this session, I will narrow down the coverage and give you an introduction about the intangible cultural heritage in Jiangnan district to echo the topic of this course. As we repeatedly mentioned Jiangnan, do you know what does Jiangnan mean? I guess many of you are not clear about it. Okay, so in this session, where I will give you a definition, the concept of what is Jiangnan to help you to better understand our course. Here is our content today. After making an explanation of Jiangnan, I will show you two representative cultural heritage in Jiangnan. The third part is the main part. I will give you an introduction of two intangible cultural heritage of UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Okay, now let's begin. What's the concept of Jiangnan? Jiangnan is a geographic area of China under different circumstances in fields of culture, geography, climate, etc. The scope, concepts, and definitions of Jiangnan are different. So, in geographical concept, the word Jiangnan is based on the Chinese name of the Yangtze River. As its name implies, it refers to the south of the Yangtze River and generally refers to the area on the south bank of the middle and lower reaches of Yangtze River. Namely, the areas are cities like Shanghai and provinces like Jiangsu Province, Zhejiang Province, Anhui Province, and Jiangxi Province. But in comprehensive concept, Jiangnan always represents a beautiful and fertile water town scene it is also a developed area with the highest comprehensive levels in China with superior natural conditions, abundant product resources, developed commodity production, and a complete industrial material tree. When we Chinese mention Jiangnan, we will think of ancient towns with small bridges, flowing waters and pillows, and elegant, simple, yet execute Jiangnan Gardens. So what portrays Jiangnan's image like this in the public eyes? First, we need to learn some knowledge about it. The history of Jiangnan can be traced back to about 7,000 years ago. And since the Han Dynasty, it's about 200 BC, officials began to live here. And during the Wei Jin Southern and Northern Dynasties, the war in the north caused a large number of people to migrate south. This trend led to the rapid development of the economy and the culture of the south, and the economic center moved south. Then, in Tang Dynasty, a considerable scale of official residents are formed here. With Hangzhou as the capital in the Southern Song Dynasty, Jiangnan has achieved unprecedented development in politics, economy, and culture. And the in Ming and Qing dynasty, Jiangnan had become the most economically and culturally developed region in the country. Wealthy people, landlords, and merchants, and also officials, they choose their, this place to build their house, villas, pavilions, and there are mansions everywhere, each with its own characteristics. Due to the large population and precious land, the buildings in the source of the Yangtze River are extremely space-saving, and their architectural art is also executed by working hard on the height of the floors. Jiangnan Classical Garden is the top that best represents the artistic achievements of Chinese classical gardens. It embodies the diligence and wisdom of Chinese intellectuals and skilled craftsmen. 
and contains philosophical and religious ideas such as Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, as well as traditional arts such as landscape, poetry, and painting. It has attracted countless Chinese and foreign tourists. Now let's watch a video and tour around a Jiangnan Classical Garden on cloud. The video we just watched is a combination of Jiangnan Classical Garden and Quenqu Opera. Quenqu Opera was the first batch of intangible cultural heritage recognized by UNESCO. Jiangnan ancient town is the intersection of water culture and ancient culture. The soul of Jiangnan ancient town is to preserve the historical features and activate modern functions. Jiangnan ancient town is a cultural heritage group, which mainly includes in ancient towns and ancient buildings and old neighborhoods. Now let's watch a video and visit some representative and well-preserved ancient town.
I want to make clear. Besides the classical images, cities in Jiangnan district all have its modern sites. You can find all the necessary elements of a modern city in cities of Jiangnan district. Here are some pictures of the main cities of it. As Jiangnan enjoyed a thriving development in cultural development in ancient China, we can expect there have been many intangible cultural heritage. In this session, we will learn two very representative examples. Both of them are listed by UNESCO as intangible cultural heritage of humanity. They are sericulture and the silk craftsmanship of China. In Chinese, we call it Zhongguotong Sang Chan and Art of Chinese Seal Graving. In Chinese, we call it Zhongguo Zuan Ke. Sericulture and silk craftsmanship of China based in Zhejiang and Jiangsu provinces, near Shanghai and Chengdu in Sichuan provinces, have an ancient history. Traditionally, an important role for women in the economy of rural regions. Silk making encompasses plant, planting mulberry, raising silk worms, unwilling silk, making thread, and designing and weaving fabric. It has been handed down within families and through apprenticeship with techniques often spreading within local groups. Now let's watch a long video and it will tell us in details how silk is made. Chinese silk is a treasure of all humankind. Sericultural and silk craftsmanship is an original Chinese creation dating back at least 5,000 years, when ancestors on this land have already domesticated silkworms and developed silkworm filaments into silk. In this time, it has become a common cultural symbol of the Chinese nation and has also exerted significant influence on human civilization through the legendary Silk Road. Today, traditional silk craftsmanship and folk customs still exist in Taihu Lake area in northern Zhejiang province, southern Jiangsu province, and Chengdu in Sichuan province and is entrenched as an indispensable element of the local cultural heritage. Mulberry leaves is a natural food for silkworms, and mulberry trees are widely spread in Taihu Lake area. The trees grow rapidly in spring, and spring leaves are picked in March. The silkworm begins life as a neck, and then it spins a cocoon and becomes a pupa before finally evolving into a moth. These four stages of its life are magical and inspiring. Silk reeling is the process whereby cocoons are placed into boiling water from where the filaments are drawn by silk reeling machines. Weaving 
is the most unique and cultivated aspect of Chinese sericultural and silk craftsmanship. The treadle transmission mechanism, the complete fabric structure system, and the storage system of patterning information are the key techniques for producing colorful silk products. Silk damask is a kind of single-layer hidden pattern textile. It has been widely used in Chinese history for the mounting of paintings and calligraphy, and is closely related with social ethics and traditional Chinese calligraphy and painting art. Gauze is composed of plain weaves and crossed structures with clear perforations on the surface and a soft and smooth texture. Brocade was the most complicated textile in ancient times. The Shu brocade originated from the Han Dynasty and is patterned with wool threads, while the Song-style silk is in lampers weave with a clear feature of its own. Silk tapestry is a decorative textile. Designed according to traditional Chinese paintings, and is woven in tapestry structures. The sericultural and silk craftsmanship also includes accompanying folk custom activities. After every spring festival, silkworm farmers invite artisans home to clear the silkworm growing rooms of evil spirits. While during the Qingming period in early April, silkworm farmers gather in Hanshan Mountain, wearing colorful silkworm flowers on their heads, to celebrate the Silkworm Flower Festival. They make offerings to the goddess of silkworms and pray for a bountiful cocoon harvest. Little paths surrounded by bamboos and streams lead to the tranquil mulberry groves. As an ancient Chinese poem goes, the silkworm farmers beckon each other to bathe the cocoons, and don't have time to enjoy the gardenia blooming in their courtyard. The farmers have lived along the Taihu Lake area for generations, and have always maintained a natural and harmonious relationship with the environment. Sericultural and silk craftsmanship is not only a source of income for the farmers, but feeds their primordial beliefs as well. They not only solemnly worship silkworms, but wear holy costumes made by silk as well to take them into heaven after death. Therefore, Chinese sericultural and silk craftsmanship is generally considered as a common culture and way of life in the region. Since the late 20th century, due to the changing economic structures, traditional sericulture has gradually declined. As a result, various sericulture customs and traditional weaving handicrafts are in danger of being lost. This makes us conscious of the importance of maintaining the viability of traditional sericulture and silk craftsmanship. And has motivated the nomination process for its inscription onto the representative list, and bring forward particular measures for safeguarding the element. Protecting zones for the techniques and folk customs of Seri culture production will be established in Hangzhou, Jiaxing, and Huzhou. While the protection and transmission center for Chinese sericultural and silk craftsmanship will be set up in the China National Silk Museum, and institutions producing silk damask, Han Guoz, Song Style Silk, Shu Silk, etc., etc., will be identified as groups for safeguarding the silk craftsmanship. 
Comprehensive surveys and identification of sericultural craftsmanship and customs will be carried out via various media, such as text, audio, video, and digital formats. And a database and website for heritage preservation will be set up. We will draw up a detailed plan, secure funding, and organize training classes to teach the skills and provide a complete safeguarding system for the preservation of Chinese sericulture and silk craftsmanship. We will set up an academic group to study the cultural heritage of the element. Push cultural institutions such as libraries and museums to research and display the element. Promote the local education departments to include it as a part of the elementary education, and encourage the media to promote and report on it. Having China's sericultural and silk craftsmanship inscribed onto the representative list will enhance the visibility of the element, raise public awareness towards it. And gain respect and attention from the world to this unique cultural heritage based on nature and handicrafts. Let's ensure the beauty of silk products will always remain to brighten up our lives and our world. The working people of China were the first people to invent and produce silk on a large scale. The silk products they produced opened up the first large-scale trade exchange between the East and the West in the history of the world, known as the Silk Road in history. Since the Han Dynasty, Chinese silk has been shipped around in large numbers and has become a world-famous product. At that time. The road from China to the West was once called the Silk Road by Europeans, and China was also called the Silk Country. Chinese working people have invented sericultural, silk reeling, and silk weaving techniques through long-term labor practice, and they have made extremely brilliant contributions to human material civilization. This is the glory of China, and the crystallization of the labor wisdom of the Chinese people. As we say that China is a country of silk, then we can see that Hangzhou is a city of silk. About 4,007 years ago, in the period of Hemu Du culture, Hangzhou people were able to make simple reeling tools. And then, in the Southern Song Dynasty, the focus of China's silk textile industry gradually shifted to Hangzhou. And during the Ming and Qing dynasties, looms could reach tens of thousands. Under the situation where silk was so prosperous, the court set up a place called the Weaving Bureau in Hangzhou. And nowadays. Hangzhou silk has become the first choice gift for foreign VIPs in countries' diplomatic activities. The other intangible cultural heritage of Jiangnan District I'm going to introduce today is the art of Chinese silk weaving. Silk weaving is an art combined with calligraphy. Fronts with more than 3,700 year history. It creates various beautiful structures and forms in square inches and between red and white. Because the fronts of most silk scripts are zuan ti, and they are written first and then carved, so they also called zuan ke, which. Translated into English is seal graving. The art of seal graving was developed from ancient seals as rice and vultures. Now let's watch a video to see how the seal is graved.
Namely, there are five kinds of seals. The first one is the most widely used one, is seal of name. The other one is seal of words. The content of this kind is not name, but short verse on words. The third one is seal of images. There are only images on the seal, no text. The fourth one is by one seal. This kind of seal is sealed with second text or image. The fifth one is Zhu Wen seal. Zhu Wen seal is the seal with sparkling text or image. So, how to use seals? There are rules. Look at this picture. This is a calligraphy work. You can put a seal of words on text around the beginning area of the main body. Usually there will be inscription between behind the main body. That's where to put seal of name. As we are seeing rules, how about this calligraphy work? Why it is full of seals? Okay, we are talking about the rules when someone just finished the calligraphy work. This picture is the work of a very famous calligrapher. These seals were put by descendants who used to own this work. Okay, so what should we prepare if we want to learn seal engraving? Here are some tools, main tools, that we need to prepare if we want to learn seal graving. The first one, of course, is graver. And then we also need to prepare red ink paste used for seals. And then it's the abrasive paper. It is also very important. So if you want to learn seal graving, you should prepare at least these following three tools. Since now we have tools, we need to pick up the right material that is suitable for us to make a seal. There are four main seal materials in China. The first one is Qingtian stone. Qingtian stone has a colorful colors peculiar patterns, and moderate hardness. It is one of the earliest and most widely used graving materials in Chinese seal graving art. The second one is Shoushan stone. Shoushan stone is a rare and precious stone unique in Fuzhou. Its stone quality is crystal clear, smooth, colorful, natural in color, and distinct in color. It has the characteristics 
of rarity, humanity, and appreciation. It is deeply loved by people at home and abroad. And in the year of 2003, it was identified as a candidate stone for the national stone. Changhua stone is produced in Changhua Town, Lin'an, Hangzhou City, Zhejiang Province. Changhua stone has a green luster, slightly transparent yellow and black in color, and semi-transparent with a few totally transparent. There are many varieties, most of which are obviously flaky white powder spots. The fourth one is Baling stone. The composition of Baling stone is almost the same as that of Qingtian stone. And it is produced in Baling, Chifeng city in North Mongolia. Baling stone has the hardness of 2 to 4 moles which not only has a high transparency, but also has a fine texture and moderate hardness. Compared with other graving stones, the most special part of Baling stone is its colorful color and strange texture. In this slide, I have listed some common seal patterns. You can have a look to see and think how to design a seal when there are two characters, three characters, four characters, and five characters. Please have a look and think it carefully. Okay, have you think of any ideas that you want to design your own seal? Okay, so how to make a seal? We have just watched the video at the beginning and have learned what tools and materials to prepare. Now let's make a conclusion. In the first step, we need to determine the content of the seal. And then we need to choose the right type of seal according to the content. The third step is we should make reasonable layout by following certain rules and regulations of seal grieving. In the fourth step, we need to determine if we want to make Bai Wen seal on Zhu Wen seal. In the fifth step, we need to dye different colors according to the difference between Zhu Wen and Bai Wen. And then we need to observe as a whole and adjust between characters and strokes, strokes and strokes. And then we will finish our work and have our seal in Hangzhou, there is a very famous seal art society called Xilin Seal Art Society. It is the earliest well-known national seal society in China, with the purpose of preserving gold and stone, researching seal studies, painting, and calligraphy. It is the oldest most successful and influential academic researching group on gold and stone seal breathing at home and abroad. It is known as the Seal Research Center and the number one society in the world. Thank you very much for watching this online class video. If you can learn something from this class, I will be very happy. Okay, thank you again.